Welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center. My name is Kristen McMahon, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the center. I will also be serving as your MC and transition person today. For our in-person audience, please take this time to either silence your phones or turn them off. I promise you at least one of them will go off at some point during today's program. So if you could take that step now, we appreciate it. And this program has benefited from the contributions of a number of entities in the area. And so I'd also like to thank the Fenton History Center, the Bemis Point Historical Society, and Media One, among many others, for helping us with today's program. We are going to cover a lot of ground today, about 90 years worth of international humanitarian law and how the world pursues justice in just a couple of hours. We are excited to have the cast of characters with us today, taking on the roles of their historic counterparts. And then we will bring you the contemporary lens, how these challenges arise today and what the world community is doing about them. We hope that this will provide a greater understanding and inspire you to contribute your voice to addressing these challenges. I want to note that one of the reasons we are holding this program today on April 28th is because in the United States, April 28th and 29th are commemorated as days of remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust. In the legislation, a joint resolution was signed in 1978, so about 45 years ago, and it commemorates the day that US troops liberated Dachau and some of the satellite camps around it. Let me start off today's program by introducing Greg Peterson of Council for Phillips Lytle and co-founder of the center to provide some background for the historical piece, which we will start with today. Greg. Wow, I am so thrilled that this could be coordinated not only via live stream, but also with the number of students. For those that are not here, there's a, just a room full of students who are here studying the Holocaust and so thrilled with the number that it, not only have come here, but have done programs earlier today and to Leanne Hendrick, who has really orchestrated this. So the serendipity of it all and the timing of it all could not have worked out any better. We're here to kind of celebrate a person who is a Chautauqua County resident who really most people don't have much of a clue about. Um, the Jamestown Bar Association has a composite in its room and at the top, 1947 composite, there's Robert H. Jackson. The center's named after him. We spent 20 plus years celebrating him, but right next to him, is Bainbridge Colby, and it's Bainbridge Colby. It says, Secretary of State under President Woodrow Wilson. Cool. A member of the Jamestown Bar was a Secretary of State. That's about as much as I knew, and we knew that he was buried in Bemis Point. A few years ago, I was uh, reading a book called In the Garden of the Beasts, and in that book by Eric Larson, uh, it talks about, it's called Love, Terror, and American Family in Hitler's Berlin. It deals with an ambassador, William Dodd. Ambassador William Dodd was appointed by President Roosevelt to be the uh, ambassador to Germany in 1934. Hitler came to power in 1933, just to put this in perspective. And he was there one day to present his credentials to the German government. And the foreign minister, von Neurath, said, uh, thanks for coming uh, with those formalized credentials, but we're not accepting him, and nor will you have a chance to meet uh, the Reichsführer Adolf Hitler today. And he was kind of aghast. And so I read from a chapter 33 called A Memorandum of a Conversation with Hitler, uh, talks about how on March 5th, 1934, he was summoned to the office, he being Ambassador Dodd, office of Foreign Minister Neuroth, who angrily demanded that he do something to halt a mock trial of Hitler set to take place two days later 
in New York's Madison Square Garden. The trial was organized by the American Jewish Congress with the support of the American Federation of Labor and a couple of dozen other Jewish and anti-Nazi organizations. The plan so outraged Hitler that he ordered Neuroth and his diplomats in Berlin and Washington to stop it, to stop it. So that was the request. Ambassador Dodd replied saying, I can't. Freedom of speech, it's a concept in the United States. And this was a non-governmental agency event, two days hence, and uh, I can't do it. Hitler was not a happy camper. So now I'm curious, mock trial against Hitler, never heard of it. We're in the business at the Jackson Center to, have, to, to hear of these things. So it turns out the trial did take place. And it goes on, and, and the, the trial took place as planned, guarded by 320 uniformed New York City policemen inside Madison Square Garden. 40 plainclothes detectives circulated among the 20,000 people in attendance. The 20 witnesses who testified during the trial included Rabbi Stephen Weiss, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, former Governor Al Smith, and, I'm reading this and I just about dropped, and a former Secretary of State, Bainbridge Colby, who delivered the opening remarks. The trial found Hitler guilty. Bainbridge Colby now appears in this Garden of the Beasts. I had no idea. So hence, we're off and running, trying to find anything that would actually memorialize this event. And in a good old all-American Google search, in a Google search, in the Western Connecticut State University archives. Did you know there was a Western Connecticut State University? I didn't. But son of a gun, there is a book entitled The Case of Civilization Against Hitlerism, presented under the auspices of the American Jewish Congress at Madison Square Garden, New York, March 7th, 1934. The pleaders, Bainbridge Colby et al. You gotta be kidding me. So now it's there, I get it digitized, I get it, we now have it. And then in coordination, just as Kristen McMahon said, with an awful lot of our uh, not-for-profit partners, here we are today. We got the transcript and we're gonna have fun going through excerpts of that. But before that, before that, we wanted to know a little bit more about Bainbridge Colby. Who was he? Because we think this is an opportunity extraordinaire to actually learn about him. And as would have it, in 1999, March of 1999, uh, Bemis Point historian Mary Jane Staley wrote a piece on Bainbridge Colby. I was so thrilled to see it. And so we have her son, John Staley, who will present that brief paper to give us a sense of who Bainbridge Colby was, a Chautauqua County resident. John? Thank you, Greg. Uh, my mother was a historian for Bemis Point in the town of Ellery, and um, she would have a, she was like a magnet of acquiring things. And uh, one of the things that she has is a beautiful painting that is outside that you'll want to take a look at. Uh, and, and it's a oil painting and actually was done by Sidney Taylor, who was the caretaker for the Colby House. So I encourage you to look at that because it is mentioned in her article. The Honorable Bainbridge Colby. The Honorable Bainbridge Colby was one of um, the area's most famous citizens. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri on December 22, 1869. He moved east and was educated at Williams College in Massachusetts. He graduated from there in 1890 and two years later received his law degree from Columbia University and the New York Law School. He was known as both a successful lawyer and nationally as a politician. One of his first clients was Samuel Clemens, otherwise known as Mark Twain, and they remained lifelong friends. 
In 1929, his wife acquired property near Bemis Point on the east side of Warner Road, opposite the Sunset Bay Road. This home was Colby's retreat. It was called the Little Brook Farm. This is where they entertained many famous people from high government and international travels. Interestingly, he was originally a Republican, but in 1912 and several times during his career, he switched political parties. In 1920, he was in Jamestown when former President Theodore Roosevelt was a Progressive Party nominee against President William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson. Mr. Colby supported TR and the Bull Moose Bolters. However, four years, four years later, in 1916, he broke with TR and supported Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson and Colby were law partners and remained close friends until Wilson's death in 1924. He continued to support Democrats, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Then, in 1932, he criticized the New Deal administration. And in 1936, he supported unsuccessful Republican candidate Governor Alfred Landon of Kansas. During the second term of President Wilson, he was appointed Secretary of State. He was sent on one occasion to Montevideo, Montevideo, Uruguay. I said that I practiced that the whole time. The blue. <laughs> to represent the president and the United States, he was at Versailles after World War I. He also signed the Nineteenth Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Mr. Colby was instrumental in forming the policy of non-recognition of Russia after the First World War. He never forgave Franklin Roosevelt for reversing the Russian policy that had been in effect for 13 years. Throughout these years, Mr. Colby was involved with many activities and decisions for the government, always writing for newspapers and giving speeches, plus writing books about the national and international scene. It was from his home in Bemis Point that he issued his press statement announcing his opposition to the second term of FDR. At the time, he was hosting Governor Alfred Landon during his visit to Chautauqua Institution. Speaking here in 1943, he warned of the post-war World War II planning that should take place second to winning the war. He warned that the planners for the world democracy and permanent peace might be overlooking the fact that some of our allies at the time were governed by dictators. This was a prophetic note. Quoting from a Washington friend, quote, in later years, Mr. Colby found life at Little Rock Farm on Lake Chautauqua increasingly attractive. There, amid these books and papers, the man who made history 30 years ago watches the record of the years fulfill his predictions. His name will long be honored for the foresight of his rejection of Russian communism proposals and for other great services to the United States. Mr. Colby passed away in his home on April 11, 1950 and is buried in the Bemis Point Cemetery. His significant collection of documents and papers were given to the Library of Congress by his widow. The family homestead was given to the state of New York by Bainbridge Colby's widow to form part of the Long Point State Park. His tombstone in Bemis Point Cemetery reads, Bainbridge Colby, the faithful public servant. Now I'll introduce Mr. Lyle Haidu, who will continue on. Thank you. When football players gather on the field, they scrimmage, 
When boxers meet in the gym, they spar. But when lawyers get together, they like to mock. <laughs> and thus we have mock trials. So what is a mock trial? For all the high school students in attendance and for the casual observer, the mock trial resembles an ordinary trial that you might see in federal, state, or local courts. It's based on an adversarial process where we have two sides. One side is represented by the prosecution who brings forth the charges, the allegations of wrongdoing against a named individual. And on the other side is the defendant with legal counsel who has an opportunity to defend against those charges. There is a judge who presides over the proceeding to ensure fairness for both sides, to apply the law, the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence, and to maintain order. And ultimately, either the judge or the jury decides the issue and renders what's known as a verdict or a judgment. And at that point, a mock trial is different from the other trials because we don't have a legal mechanism to enforce that verdict or that judgment. So it must be done for a different reason. Now just last week in this building, the high school students held mock trials. The purpose was educational. And across the country, law students are holding mock trials. And the purpose of that is to hone skills for becoming a lawyer. But in 1934, that was not the reason for this mock trial. In 1934, there was growing concern that Hitler was gaining popularity and support, both in the United States and abroad. And the question arose from those who saw what was happening is, what do we do about it? So in the words of Thomas More, the Irish poet, not the English lawyer, Quote, the devil, the proud spirit, cannot endure to be mocked, end quote. And so, on March 7th of 1934, this mock trial was held at Madison Square Garden. The purpose? To mock Hitler, to expose his true nature and to sway public opinion against his regime. It was entitled, The Case of Civilization Against Hitlerism. There were 21 separate dignitaries who appeared and pleaded the case. It was well covered by the New York Times and other media. And for our purposes of today, and for the sake of time, we're gonna present five speakers who will each read excerpts from the actual transcript. At 8.30 p.m., before a standing room-only audience of 20,000, an American Legion bugler blew taps, and the audience rose for a moment of silence in honor of those killed in Nazi Germany. A court crier then opened the event by calling out, Hear ye, hear ye! All those who have business before this court of civilization, give your attention and ye shall be heard. As mentioned, 21 VIPs from various walks of life appeared as prosecution witnesses, each making a brief presentation and summarizing Hitler's offenses in particular area or against a particular group. I would now like to introduce Bainbridge Colby, who gave the opening statement at Madison Square Garden as portrayed by Bemis Point's Andrew Goodell. We have come together tonight in the greatest place of assembly to be found 
in our country. The thousands who crowd this huge auditorium make up a mighty host. But they are only a small fraction of the millions whose thoughts are centered here and who wait with eagerness every word that will be spoken. America is speaking tonight, not only for herself, but for civilization and human brotherhood. We are piously met. We bow reverently before our Lord and Master, who hath commanded us that we love our neighbors as ourselves. And this love he has defined as feeling for our fellow man that works no injury. A great oppression has descended upon mankind, a grievous affront to the world's sense of justice and humanity. It has been committed by the infatuated usurpers of public power in Germany. The wanton and cruel injuries inflicted upon hundreds of thousands of Jews solely because of their Jewish blood have shocked the world. They cry aloud for regress. They have planted hostility to the present regime in Germany in every quarter of the world where no hostility has been felt before. The love of justice, which is the highest attribute of man, has been stirred to its depths by the unending story of outrage and brutality, which, despite all the efforts of suppression, steadily flows out of Germany. Abhorrence of such cruelty and oppression is felt throughout the United States in common with every civilized nation in the world. America detests it. And tonight, the stern apprehension and reprobation which such acts deserve and inspire in every right thinking person will find expression in this meeting. You will hear spokesmen of the church, of the state, and the bar. You will be addressed by representatives of civic and social bodies, of national membership, and widest influence. The great body of our nation's work workers have sent their chosen leaders to speak to us. Our institutions of learning will be heard. Never has there been assembled upon a public platform such a broadly representative group of speakers. Every party, every creed, every section of public opinion is authoritatively presented at this hour. The truth will be uttered by men who love it and serve it. And the truth is mighty and will prevail. And to lead us in our presentation, I want to welcome Senator Millard Tidings, who is portrayed by our own Senator George Borello. One hundred and fifty eight years ago, a great American leader gave to the world a new conception of humanity. On an immortal parchment which symbolized the impulses of Americans of that Americans of that era, he proclaimed that certain truths are self evident 
and that men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, in the backwash of the great international holocaust, which began in 1914, in this period of worldwide economic, financial, and political disaster, these enduring principles in some parts of the world are threatened with extinction. For what we have learned with pain and displeasure, that in a great nation there have been singled out 600,000 of its citizens who have been commanded not to bear the common burden of their fellow, but to suffer as a group the loss of their property, their religious and personal liberties, for no other reason, forsooth, than they are the son of their fathers. We are met here tonight not to attempt a cure, but who are these 600,000 German citizens whose rights have been abrogated? Let us see. Official statistics tell us that 17% of the entire Jewish population of Germany served that country in the Great War. That one out of every five men, women, and children of Jewish blood was a soldier in the German army. These figures further state that of this group, 30,000 were decorated for bravery. 20,000 were cited for distinguished service. 2,000 of them rose to the rank of officer while serving under the German colors. These and their families are now outcasts. They were asked to give life itself for their country and its greatest hour of need. This they gave. Having given, they are now denied the equal privileges of peace. Those who attend this gathering symbolize the thoughts and impulses of millions of our countrymen who are absent in the body, but present in spirit. They, no less, we, see the inordinate cruelty, the injustice, the intolerance of this persecution of the Jews. They, like ourselves, seek to raise before the eyes of the world the torch of tolerance to guide a world already sick from excesses, the greed, and the blindness of mankind. Finally, we affirm our intention to continue to keep this crime pilloried before all the world in the fervent hope that, in the councils of present German government, a calmer view, a more civilized action may evolve, and that the 600,000 persecuted Jews beyond the sea may regain for themselves and their posterity the inalienable rights to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. And now it's my honor to introduce the mayor of the city of New York, the Honorable Fiorella, Fiorella LaGuardia, uh, who is portrayed today by the Honorable Mayor of Jamestown, Eddie Sundquist. I'm here to join with my fellow New Yorkers in a great protest, not just against the German people, but against the present German government. No government that maintains itself by brute force and the machine gun can be said to be governing with the consent of the governed. Our concern for conditions in Germany is not local. Our protest is not based entirely on the outrages that have been committed. We, as Americans, have, been, have a grave concern because we see the same philosophy, the same arrogance, the same conceit, the same ruthlessness that precipitated a peaceful world into a world war. Hitler is not fit to have placed in his hands the possibilities of peace in Europe. Of course, we know that a government based on such a program cannot endure. Hitlerism cannot destroy the contribution to the civilization of the Jew. The word cement, excuse me, the word Semitic was established in the annals of the civilization 50 centuries before the word Aryan was in force. During the program this evening, it was stated here by a responsible citizen 
that he was advised by our council to leave Germany because they could not guarantee his protection. That in of itself ought to be sufficient to have protests made all over the country, as it is contrary to the traditions and policies of our republic. The outrages that took place under the Romanov dynasty were not as vicious or as cruel as those in Germany today. And yet, in those days, the government did protest. It did abrogate its treaty of friendship with the imperial government of Russia. And I say that it is difficult for the American Republic to maintain friendly relations with any country where its citizens cannot travel in the safety with an American passport. I would like to introduce Stephen Wise, Honorary President of the American Jewish Congress, portrayed by Michael Goldman. One year ago, the Jews of New York met in this hall to protest against the first decrees and deeds of the Hitler regime. Tonight, after a tragic year, America stands here not to protest against, but to indict Hitlerism on the charge of betraying civilization. Hitlerism began its dread regime one year ago with hurt and wrong to the Jew. It finishes the year amid the lamentations and execrations of the civilized world. I thank God that we who are Jews do not stand alone. We are not the only victims of Hitlerism. We differ from all other victims thereof in two respects. One, we were the first to suffer prescription, humiliation, degradation, and there has been no abatement. Two, all that Hitlerism has devised and threatened against other groups and parties it has ruthlessly executed and perpetrated against the Jewish people. If we who are Jews were the only victims of Hitlerism and all other elements of civilized society felt themselves in sympathy and agreement with the Nazi Reich, then our situation would indeed be tragic beyond belief. But in this hour, we, the Jews, find ourselves together with all groups and factors within civilization, including the great Catholic Church and the Protestant churches of the land. Hitlerism being at one and the same time, the denial of Jesus and the negation of every type and manner of Christianity in favor of an ancient pagan cult of hate. One year ago, save for the voices of individuals, we stood alone. Tonight, after one year, we no longer stand alone. For within the year, Hitlerism has assaulted all of civilization. And tonight, we Jews are no longer alone, who are surrounded and upheld by all the forces of civilization. One year ago, we were nearly shattered by the dread advent of the powers of Hitlerism. Tonight, despite the year of unspeakable wrong and immeasurable wrongs, we are sustained by the comradeship of civilization. Not without hope, we suffer and we mourn. We rest our hope in civilization, which speaks to us tonight in the ancient and divine accents of, fear not, Jacob, my servant. We are the prisoners of hope and the children of hope. Our standard and our song being, our hope shall not perish. We join with civilization in warning the Hitler land that many, many take all of Farzen. Let it not come to pass that Germany, once proud and mighty, perish because the evil of its leadership and blindness of its following. Not without hope, we suffer and we mourn. 
for civilization has lifted up its sacred sword to shield us and itself. Civilization cries tonight. Hitler's Huns are at the gates, they shall not pass. Whatever betide, we shall not fear, for we share the fate and the struggle of civilization. For centuries and centuries, our fathers sang, Behold the guardian of Israel doth neither sleep nor slumber. We say tonight, Behold the guardians and defenders of civilization will not be silent nor yet afraid. It's my honor to introduce uh, John Haynes Holmes, portrayed by the Honorable John Ward to read the judgment. The judgment of the court. Adolf Hitler has been tried within this place. He has been convicted by the authentic evidence, by the outraged feelings, and by the eloquent speeches. It is fitting that after this trial and conviction, we should hear the judgment of the court. I am privileged to bring this meeting to a close by presenting to you a formal resolution. <clears throat> because the leaders of the National Socialist Party of Germany, in violation of their oaths of office, have seized power and by a coup d'etat destroyed, destroyed the German Republic and abolished its constitution, and because they have set up in its place the arbitrary and brutal rule of a minority, because Hitler and his followers turned their backs on civilized tradition of government and law and order in Germany, because they set up the arbitrary will of the leader in the place of the administration of justice and above the rule of law, because they exterminated every vestige of the hard-won liberties of the forgotten men and women whose defense and protection has made up the progress of civilization, because they have destroyed security of person and property, because they have abolished freedom of speech and of the press, because they have rendered impossible freedom of teaching and research, and because they seek to enslave instruction in the arts and sciences to the purposes of the ruling party, regardless of scientific truth and artistic honesty. Because the war against and because they war against and seek to destroy freedom of conscience because they have deprived citizens of the right to petition the government for the redress of wrongs and have destroyed every possibility of lawful appeal from the injustice of the persons in power whom they call the state. Because the scientifically false and mythical differences of race have been invoked to deprive the 600,000 Jews of Germany of their civil and human rights and to make them victims of a policy and a program whose goal is their complete extermination, because they treat differences of opinion as heresies subject to inquisition and to be punished by imprisonment and torture. Because according to the declaration of their leader, they base their rule upon a combination of force and fraud, a technique of the deception of the masses of their people both by suppressing the true and spreading the false. Because they are employing this technique of lies and propaganda to gain their ends in foreign lands with which they are publicly at peace. Because by doctrine, by law, and by administrative procedure, they are degrading womanhood in Germany from the position of human beings who share equally with men in the duties and responsibilities of civilized life, because they have robbed the working men of Germany of their right of free association and of the protection of, by the law of their trade union standards and conditions, and because they have subordinated workers to leaders 
to whom they stand related as medieval serfs to their masters. Because they have cut off the arts of Germany from the fertilizing contacts with the rest of the world and have inhibited those discoveries, inventions, and variations in which the progress of art consists. Because they have inhibited the sciences from the pursuit of truth and have subordinated them to the purposes of their state. Because of their financial methods, they have cheated and are continuing to cheat both the public and private creditors of Germany of their due. Because they speak of peace, they have 1,300,000 marching, marching men in uniform and have made instruction in the art of war a part of the curriculum in every institution of higher education. Because they have defied, insulted, and endeavored to disrupt the instrumentalities of international cooperation and international peace, and have by this and other means thrown Europe into a state of war tension such as prevailed in 1914. Therefore, we, the citizens of the United States of America, assembled together in Madison Square Garden in the city of New York on Wednesday, March 7, 1934, upon the first anniversary of the Hitlerite coup d'etat, solemnly declare that the National Socialist Government of Germany has turned its face against the historic progress and the positive blessings and achievements of modern civilization. It has shown itself by doctrine and practice to be the avowed enemy of those methods of peace and freedom by which the march of civilization has been enabled and the progress of mankind accomplished. We declare that the Hitlerite, the Hitler government is compelling the German people to turn back from civilization to an antiquated, antiquated and barbarous despotism which menaces the progress of mankind toward peace and freedom and is a present threat against civilized life throughout the world. To the great masses of the German people, who are thus being made the victims of a regression to tragic and terrible, we express our deep sympathy and friendship. We recognize the wrongs which they have suffered on account of the inequities of the Treaty of Versailles. We deplore the enhancement of those wrongs because of the mistaken post-war policies of the victors in the Great War. We admire the resolution, the good sense, and the endurance with which the German people at the end of the war undertook further to advance civilization by means of the free government and free institutions of the German Republic, which Hitlerism has with ruthless malice destroyed. We deeply deplore the fact that the efforts of the Republic received from other nations less cooperation than they deserved. But we deem it our solemn duty to point out, as time passed, this cooperation improved in scope, in degree, and in kind, and that when the Hitler coup d'etat destroyed freedom and justice in Germany and began to undermine German civilization, all the people of Germany, regardless of race, sex, or creed, may restore for themselves and for their children each and every one of those rights and duties, those opportunities for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in which just government at home consists, and that the German nation, thus freed, may at last take its place as an equal and free member of the family of nations in the cooperative enterprise of civilization. Until that day arrives, the German government stands convicted by its own acts of crime against civilization. At this time, this proceeding stands in adjournment.
Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for all the presenters and pleaders of this extraordinary uh, reenactment of this 1934. 34. I said 34, not 44, 34. So this was a very prescient type uh, mock trial. However, there was more. There was more. There was the rest of the story. This was covered uh, by radio broadcast and it's covered by the media thereafter. So to provide us with, and excuse me for the Paul Harvey mention, the rest of the story is our own media giant here in Jamestown, Dennis Webster. Good afternoon, thank you. Allow me the opportunity to read some news dispatches that I have written to encapsulate certain events at certain places in time. New York City, March 8, 1934. Some 15,000 people were still in their seats at Madison Square Garden at 12.15 this morning when the verdict was read in the case of civilization against Hitler. From the opening remarks by former Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby to the final verdict delivered by John Haynes Holmes, senior minister of the community church, the outcome of this mock trial was never in doubt. Hitlerism was decried, convicted as a crime against civilization. The atrocities attended to it were recounted in detail as 21 prominent speakers took to the stage. Anti-Semitism, degradation of women, cruel violence inflicted on lawfully abiding citizens, removal of academic freedom, repression of churches, among others. From the perspective of the law, it was a novel and imaginary proceeding, allowing the verdict to be rendered by those in attendance or as Bernard Deutsch, president of the American Jewish Congress stated, civilization makes this indictment and calls upon the jury of enlightened public opinion to render its verdict, that it serves as an expression of the horror of civilization over what has transpired. Chicago, April 15th, 1934. The mock trial of Hitlerism planned for this city will most certainly not occur. Leaders of the Jewish community here who had strongly advocated for an event similar to the one in Madison Square Garden in New York in March, are now mute on the subject. There is no known connection, but William Dodd, the United States ambassador in Berlin, recently returned to this city as part of a two-month respite from his official duties. Dodd is well-connected here, having served as a history professor at the University of Chicago before assuming the ambassador's post in Germany. While in this city, he is also reported to have met with at least two prominent members of Chicago's Jewish community. The subject of those meetings has not been publicly disclosed, but it is widely known that the March mock trial of Hitlerism in New York rankled some members of President Roosevelt's cabinet at a time when relations with Germany are very much on edge. New Deck, East Prussia, August 2nd, 1934. Paul von Hindenburg, President of Germany, has died. At the age of 86, he had been in ill health for some time. One day prior, Chancellor Hitler's cabinet enacted the law concerning the head of the German Reich, which consolidated the roles of president and chancellor. The Fuhrer is now the sole leader of Germany. Glewitz, Germany, September 1st, 1939. German Wehrmacht forces are streaming into Poland from three directions this morning. The pretext for this invasion came yesterday when a German radio station in the city near the Polish border was attacked. Press sources within the German government were quick to identify the perpetrators as Poles. There is legitimate skepticism as to whether this is true, as the Glewitz incident resembles several other similar incursions over the last several days, some of which are known to have been staged events. Fuhrer Hitler is expected to address the Reichstag later today. Washington. September 3rd, 1939. In a fireside chat to the nation tonight, President Roosevelt said, until 4.30 this morning, I had hoped against hope that some miracle would prevent a devastating war in Europe and bring an end to the invasion of Poland by Germany. He encouraged all Americans to be circumspect regarding news of this new war. And he concluded, I hope the United States will keep out of this war. And I believe that it will. And I give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end. Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The 
December 7th, 1941, Japanese aircraft launched a massive attack on the U.S. naval base here today. Preliminary estimates put the number of casualties at over 2,000. 12 ships were sunk or beached. 160 aircraft destroyed, a similar number damaged. December 11th, 1941, Washington, United States Congress today, declared war on Germany in the same matter it did three years ago in declaring war against Japan. Franklin Roosevelt, the president who has frequently said, I hate war, requested this declaration. In his message to the Congress, he wrote, the forces endeavoring to enslave the entire world are now moving toward this hemisphere. Never before has there been a greater challenge to life, liberty, and civilization. New York City, September 2nd, 1945. Throngs of people swarmed into the streets of Times Square and throughout the city today, following Japan's signing of surrender papers aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo. The celebrations here and across the United States were even more jubilant than May 8th, when victory in Europe was declared. Over 400,000 Americans lost their lives in service to the nation in the four years of war. Nuremberg, Germany, November 21st, 1945. At the Palace of Justice in the city today, Robert H. Jackson, Chief of Counsel for the United States, made his opening statement to the International Military Tribunal, charged with trying powerful Nazi leaders accused of heinous crimes. He said the tribunal, while novel and experimental, is not the product of abstract speculations. Near the end of his lengthy remarks, he added, the real complaining party at your bar is civilization. Lemus Point, New York, April 12, 1950. Former Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby died at his home in this village last night. Colby directed the State Department during the final two years of Woodward Wilson's presidency. Best known for his 1920 repudiation of the Lenin Trotsky regime in Russia, he reemerged on the public stage in 1934 as presiding officer of the Madison Square Garden mock trial of Adolf Hitler, known as the case of civilization against Hitler. Colby had been battling the consequences of pneumonia for two years. Jamestown, New York, January 17th. 2001. Local attorney Greg Peterson convened a meeting today in the theater of the consistory building in downtown Jamestown. There he received commitments from two prominent citizens, Carl Kappa and Betty Linnae, for $500,000 each to acquire a facility and develop a center to enshrine the legacy of Robert H. Jackson, the Jamestown area native whose work at Nuremberg set a framework for the prosecution of war crimes on the international level for the first time in civilization. It is to Mr. Peterson that we return the program. Wow. Wow. That is the rest of the story, except, except one final piece. We've heard a lot tonight about Bainbridge Colby and about his legacy. Working with the United States Library of Congress, we, they were able to find and we will, were able to extract and to digitize and edit a small piece of the man we've been honoring. So this is the bonus. This is 1920 presentation on the subject of loyalty by Bainbridge Colby. <laughs> It is important that we should constantly keep before us the duty of inculcating in the minds of our citizens from overseas the true meaning and significance of America and the high duty that rests upon every generation to sustain our blessed institution and to transmit them to posterity strengthened and unimpaired. The test of good citizenship 
is loyalty to country. And one cannot discharge the duty of loyalty without a patient and an open-minded study of the institutions that mark the country and define its character. America stands for individual liberty, but that means an ordered liberty, a liberty subject to law and subordinate to the common welfare. The social and industrial structure of America is founded upon an enlightened citizenship. This presupposes education. Americanism demands loyalty to the teacher and respect for his lessons. I am deeply concerned with the diminution of the teaching strength of the country as a result of the disproportionately low salaries that are paid to teachers throughout the country. We must look to this right promptly. It is a condition that must not be suffered to continue. Loyalty to America means loyalty to her chosen servants, from president down. We must stifle the voice of hatred and faction. We must realize that there is not a man who holds office except as a result of the free choice of our citizens. It is a high patriotic duty that we support and sustain the men who have been placed in positions of difficulty, burden, responsibility, and even danger as the result of our suffrage. That does not mean that we must forego just and fair criticism or refrain from opposition to policies which are debatable or which do not command our approval. An intelligent and conscientious opposition is a part of loyalty to country. But we must not, if we are loyal, disperse our energies in a partisan warfare that is waged without regard to its consequences to the well-being, security, or honor of the country. We must be loyal to the form of our government. Under it, we have grown great in numbers, wealth, and national influence. We must be loyal to the words that have come down to us from the past, bequeathed by Americans who have lived great lives in the service of America. Loyalty to America requires that we should preserve a friendly and encouraging and sympathetic goodwill toward our day and generation. Like pictures, men should be judged by their merits and not by their defects. Loyalty will not permit envy, hate, and uncharitableness to creep into our public thinking. Thus, only in a hopeful and confident temper, in a proud and constructive spirit, will we rescue the present and safeguard the future of our beloved country. The times call loudly to each of us for loyalty. Loyalty of purpose, loyalty of thought, loyalty of effort, and the loyalty of patience.